I think we're going to get underway. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome again to uh, Marquette University Law School. Um, Eckstein Hall, I'm Mike Goucher, and this is On the Issues. This is our continuing series of conversation, conversations with news and policy makers, people who uh, we say are doing interesting, important work in this region and beyond. Today, we're delighted to be joined by the Chief Judge of the First Judicial District in the state of Wisconsin, Maxine White. Won't you please give her a warm welcome to Marquette Law School. This is actually uh, the second time uh, Judge White has been here to the law school as a part of this program. I think I was just starting here the last time you came and joined me, so I thought, too much time has passed, and let's bring Judge White back because you've got some new responsibilities now. You're the uh, chief judge, a job you uh, assumed in August, and, and before we get into talking about some of the challenges facing Milwaukee County courts today, I wanted to give you a chance to, to talk about your vision, your goals as, as the new chief administrator of Milwaukee County's courts. Thank you, Mike, and thank you all for being here. I'm really impressed uh, <laughs> to know that I'm interesting than was your other, <laughs> <laughs> other caveat. Uh, yes, uh, since August 1st of 1992, I've been serving uh, Milwaukee County in Wisconsin as a trial judge here in Milwaukee, and it's been an awesome journey. Uh, one that I was uh, well prepared to assume, but had no idea what uh, it would be like. And it's been a transformational journey for me, and I hope for a lot of people who have had uh, to appear before me in various matters across the, the decades. Uh, as the chief administrator for the first judicial district, it's similar to that of a CEO, uh, but uh, without uh, the budgetary pen, and maybe some CEOs have this same challenge. And also without total control of all of my minions. <laughs> and what I mean by that is there are 47 judges in the first judicial district. We are the biggest district in the state, and we handle uh, significant workloads. Each one of the trial judges are elected, so they are constitutional officers, just like I am. Our rules are uh, comprised of policies and procedures that are set either through the legislative body of our state or the Supreme Court. So the Supreme Court has given me the power to serve as the CEO over this district. It includes not only the trial courts in all of the attendant parts, but also the 19 municipal courts in the first judicial district. So it's quite a challenge. Um, I don't know what you want me to keep rolling. Well, just tell me what the what not. I mean, you're you're new to the job. What, what's the vision? What what do you want to see uh, this job become? What do you want to see addressed as as the leader of the, of the court system here? I want to make sure that we are on target with our mission. Our mission is defined in the Constitution of the State of Wisconsin and the Constitution of the United States of America. We are duty bound to protect the rights, the liberties, and the privileges of the citizens. We are also duty bound to maintain the rule of law in our court proceedings. And finally, and most important to most people who are at the courthouse right now, is that they want judges who are there providing a forum for them to resolve their disputes. Whether it's a ticket or whether it's an eviction action or a homicide case, they want us in the saddle and ready to ride and ready to administer a court. They just don't want any forum. So my vision is to make sure that we continue to build the integrity of the system so that people have more confidence in us, that we will in fact provide a fair forum, an independent forum, not governed by politics, a forum that is respectful and accessible, and one that's effective, that really gives you solutions that you can live by. So my vision is to make sure that I maintain what we already have build on it with my colleagues, and do the work of the people each and every day, one case at a time, all day, every day. So my vision uh, includes, for example, making certain that we work with the other stakeholders, the mayor, the chief of police, the sheriff, the county exec, and everybody, and let them know that when they have constituents or business that they bring toward the courthouse, we are there willing and ready to take on the load. We are accessible. We are flexible. We have a, um, a mission that's separate and apart from the legislative body and the executive body. 
But our mission clearly mixes with the other when it comes to the public good. So my vision will be to make sure that we have the adequate resources that we need. And I'm always looking for innovative ideas to do that. Right now, there's a group in town, for example, from New York, who's offering us up to $2 million to participate in an innovative project that will bring resources to the people of this county. That's just one example of how I intend to magnify the mission of this job. But on a day-to-day -day basis, it's not like Oprah. On a day-to-day -day basis, I have to make certain that the 21 criminal courts are running, that they have adequate staff, that the bailiffs are there securing the public and the people who are court users, that the, the staff that's there with the court is adequate and trained, that the judges are trained, that they are trained on the best practices to use with the people of this county, that they recognize that they have to speak the words and explain the rationale for the decisions that they make, that you are entitled to know what we decide, what we base it upon, and why we think is fair. And so every day I'm either training, seeking training, getting resources, filling chairs that are empty and in need of resources so that the decisions can be made in each and every case that's brought to us. Judge, I want to follow up on something you said. You mentioned you want people to have confidence in the criminal justice system. And, and, and let me ask a very direct question. Do you think people in Milwaukee County, do people in general have confidence that the criminal justice system works the way it was intended? Well, we get a lot of compliments, and you never, never hear about those. Whether I'm at the grocery store, or at the, the market, in the mall, or walking around the outside of the exterior. Because there are hundreds, over 120,000 people, for example, last year came to the courthouse about a court matter. But you hear about the, the ma ma majority that you hear about are the ones that had really high challenges and really are disappointed with the results. And that's a human response. We accept that. And so the confidence building, though, is more than just the outcome of a case. It is whether or not you're treated with respect when you walk up to the entryway and you are unable to ambulate on your own to get through the door. I want to make sure that the simplest thing occurs, that there are people there to assist, that wheelchairs are available in adequate numbers. It might sound like I'm running a Walmart. And some days it feels like that. But people want to be able to get in, get through the security line, find out where the court is. That we are three or four different buildings, whether you're in the right building or not, whether it's municipal court you should be at or. So the confidence is, how much time did I as a citizen waste just to handle a small bit of business, to get a marriage license or death certificate? How much time did it take me? And what was the appearance and the treatment that I received in the process. And then on a higher plane, if I am a victim of a crime, a real dastardly crime that really harmed me and my family, when I come down to the courthouse, is there someone to greet me? Am I seated in the hallway with the families of the perpetrators? And if I am seated in the hallway, how long am I left there? Do I have any comforts, human comforts? And so on a daily basis, we're dealing, about, dealing with the basic tenets of decency. And sometimes in our court system, except when we view it in the entertainment industry on TV, we don't want to give deference our regard to having a nice place, an orderly place, a safe place, an informed place with trained and respectful people that treat the people with dignity and deliver uh, the outcome of cases. So I'm fighting mm -hmm. for the public good to be able to enter that courthouse find judges who are trained and responsive and respectful with staff who accommodate them so that they can quickly and within a reasonable period of time, whether you're charged with a crime, whether you're there as a corporate entity waiting for some type of relief, whether you have a medical negligence issue, or whether you're just there for an eviction action. I want everybody to have a sense of feeling of accommodation and decency. And sometime in our system, the judges and I all reflect on this, we don't have that type of operation. We have to keep working to produce that type of operation for the average person. When I first uh, invited Judge White uh, to, to join us for this program, uh, I mentioned to her that, that I wanted to spend some time talking about what's being seen in the courtrooms of Milwaukee County, what judges are, are seeing today, especially given what we all hear a lot about, and that is you know, uh, a dramatic increase in homicides in this city 
we have, uh, I think we would all agree, far too many shootings in the city. But I was interested in knowing what you're seeing from the perspective of the bench, what judges who handle these kinds of cases are seeing. Take us inside the courtroom. What is it like given sort of the tenor of our times? Well, we have 47 judges and 22 commissioners. Uh, this is a trial day. If you are here, you're not on jury duty, I hope. Uh, but of those 47 judges, one of them is exempt from having an ordinary calendar, and that's me. The other 46 have assignments. 21 of the 46 handle nothing but criminal cases. Uh, and then we have eight judges that handle the children in need of protection, the uh, termination of parental rights, we have them handling the delinquencies, and they are located at the juvenile, uh, Vail Phillips Juvenile Justice Center in Wauwatosa, known as the Children's Court Center. We have about 14 judges handling major civil lawsuits, and then we have a number of judges that are handling other matters, such as probate cases and uh, specialized court operations. So on the average day, the courthouse is filled with a number of people going a number of different ways. I sat on the bench uh, before becoming a, a chief administrator for the district. Over the last seven years, I presided over family cases as a presiding judge as well. So in that division, 10 of the commissioners are operating on the seventh floor, where hundreds of citizens visit every day for restraining orders, for Orders organizing whatever should happen on the beginning phases of a divorce. Orders about the custody and placement of the children. The preliminary orders that are entered by the commissioners. Down on one floor below are the judges that act as the appeals court to the, uh, what is going on on the seventh floor. So a lot of activity is going on in each division. We have five separate divisions, and each division is very busy. The family division, the civil division, the juvenile, juvenile division, the criminal division, and then we have a, a probate division. But I want you to know that on each given day, every judge is actively engaged in some type of case. So today we have a number of criminal courts that are handling jury trials. We have a number of courts that are handling sentencing hearings. We have a number of courts that are handling what we call uh, competency hearings to determine whether or not the person is that's charged with an offense, is competent to the stand trial. In the probate division, for example, somebody may be present before a court trying to figure out what to do with the assets of a lost loved one. Or they may be there because they are fear that an aged family member is being harmed by someone else. So that activity is going on to decide what type of protective order should be entered. Hundreds of people visit the courthouse every day, and all types of activities are going on in different courtrooms. So what you will see is a lot of action in the hallways. You will see bailiffs moving prisoners. You will see bailiffs moving groups of people that are going to courtrooms to serve as jurors. You will see other staff securing files from other parts of the courthouse. But in each of those courtrooms, one at a time, the judge is on the bench, the staff is in place, the court reporter is there, the parties are presenting whether they're represented or not. They are presenting their positions to the judge. And the judge hopefully knows the law, inquires of the law, listens to the facts, <coughs> apply the facts in that particular controversy to the law, and provide an outcome to the people, even if it's not the final one. So there are a lot of cases in our courthouse that you get a, a preliminary indication of an outcome, but it's not the final outcome. But for most of the business that we take on for the people at the trial court level. In Wisconsin, we have the trial court where I sit. The middle court is the appellate court, and then there's the Supreme Court. For most people, not just in Wisconsin, but in the United States of America, the trial court is the last word on your case. Even if you appeal it, if any judge is worth his or her salt, they would have applied the standards of law, the policies and procedures and practices, and given you an opportunity to be heard. We have great discretion to decide the outcome of disputes. I talked to a couple of judges before I reported here this morning, uh, and the one thing I can do, I should say, Mike, is that I can see everybody's work. 
Yes, the judges and the commissioners in the audience. I know what your calendars look like. <laughs> I know every case that's assigned to you. I know every entry that's made about the activity on that case because that's my, my job is to know. To know if you need assistance, if you have a complete action, if a citizen is questioning whether or not they've gotten complete relief, I can see the activities of the court. And I mean it globally, the activities of the court. But the one thing that, that uh, you can rest assured of is that even on these preliminary decisions that people get, they want to know exactly what happened at any given time, what is expected of them, and then what's next. So one of the ways to build confidence and to explain to people what go on in the courthouse is to make sure that what we say is being heard by sometimes uh, figuring out if the people can recite to us what actually happened in a particular case. So one of the judges I talked to this morning said to me, uh, when they ask you the question about the uptick in violence, you can report what the national newspapers are reporting. He's the judge that presides over what is known as a gun court. We like to give labels to things, but labels are so misleading. It's a simplification of one, it's one simplification of just how difficult the job is. Let me describe to you on August 1st what gun court looked like to me. It was a court assigned to one judge with a calendar of over 500 cases. On the docket for his case load included, about half of them were status gun cases. And what I mean by that is, if you are a convicted felon, or someone who's been adjudicated delinquent, or possessed a firearm in some way in the past, that causes the laws in the court to tell you, you can never possess a gun again. When you pick it up again, you're known as a felon in possession of a firearm. Half of his cases would involve, for example, just a police witness, whomever saw Maxine possess a gun, uh, maybe a neighbor called and thought they saw me or somebody with a gun. Cop comes, finds out I'm, I'm not entitled to have it. That privilege has been taken away from me because of previous conduct. It's a pretty deliberate case. The DA gets the arrestee, charges the person with the crime. Cop comes to court at a court trial or a jury trial, testifies. The jury probably would believe that the person possessed it because there's not much controversy about it. Case goes pretty fast. It's kind of a victimless crime in that there was no discharge of the weapon. They had it, and they shouldn't have. It's, a, it's an absolute a violation of the law if you're restricted and you, dis, uh, and you disobey it anyway. The other half of his 500 cases are not, in my view, gun cases. Let me tell you what they look like. They are non-fatal shooting cases. That means that the victim didn't die because of good medical care. But for good medical care, it would be with the homicide uh, court instead of the gun court. So over 200, about 250 cases in that one court alone involved people who had discharged a weapon and hit somebody's body, causing bodily injury in some type of way. So I say to him, what have you learned about just your little uh, area of the 47 courts, about what you're seeing in front of you? He said, flashes of anger. No one trend about any certain things. No horrific gang violence, uh, warring lords uh, over turf of some type. Family disputes, uncle and aunt in the backyard, 15 or 53. He says all age groups, just flashes of anger, mostly racial minorities, uh, poor, uh, not really connected to jobs, or other things kind of on the outs with their families, but people who really seem to emit the kind of characteristics that you might think that they've lost hope but really have no a attachment to consequences. And that's what he said. It's, it's not, it's complex. So if you want the, the police and the DA to apprehend all of this category, you almost got to just sit there on every house, in every neighborhood, on every street all the time to get a sense of who's next. And he said that a lot of people with the felons in possession of the firearms, they think that if I don't have one with me, I'm not really safe. Even though I know that if I get caught with it, I face huge penalties of incarceration. I need it because I know where I am. I know who my associates are. 
And I know if I don't have the gun, the introduction of the gun into things are really what's driving the bad statistics uh, around unsafe neighborhoods. Of the 10 major cities that are being measured, we're number one. We have increased uh, the loss of life cases, I call them, instead of the non-fatals. Because if you stick the 500 on with the 125 that have lost their lives this year, we're up near, we're going toward the 1,000. But somehow or another, no disrespect to you, Mike, we, we count the homicides, and I want to scream to the top of the mountain inside the courthouse in the walls because I know that we have massive debt that we are accumulating around the people who didn't die. They didn't die because our medical care has improved substantially in this nation. But we will be caring for them. They're in wheelchairs. They've lost the use of their legs. Some of them have bullets still in their skull. They already had uh, challenges in life. And now that they are physically impaired, along with the mental and other trauma-related things, we will be caring for this crowd for the rest of our lives. And it draws substantially on the resources. So what we are trying to do as a, a, a co-equal partner with the other stakeholders, especially the legislative and the executive branch, is to share with them these kinds of uh, trends. But we are number one on the list, and no one comes close to the 76% increase over last year in homicide rates, and that's not counting the non-fatal shootings. So what we see on one end of the courthouse may be these kinds of public ills and harms of citizen against citizen, and even the sanctions that we give will not guarantee that they won't continue, because that person we locked them up for 25 years. They weren't ever going to shoot anybody else anyway. What we need to figure out is, from the populace, from the juvenile justice center, all the way into the adult center, is who is it that we're missing that's likely to become the next one who commits the non-fatal shooting act or the homicide act? And that's a complex dichotomy. Judge, you're you talking about sanctions. I mean, let, let's talk for a moment about sentencing. And, and the challenges judges face uh, in, in, in delivering the right sentences for hundreds and hundreds of shootings. What are judges looking at today? They, they, they come under fire. You hear it. You've got people even in this county saying the judges are soft on these criminals. That's part of the problem. Tell us about the mindset, the judges that are having to make these decisions. How are they coming to the, their final conclusions? Well, the one thing that we have uh, going for us is that it's, it's hard to hide from the truth. And what we're trying to perpetrate on the other stakeholders is to come to us so we can tell you the truth about whatever you're measuring when you think about what the sentences really reflect. We are duty bound by the legislative body made sure of it and the Supreme Court rubber stamped it. We're duty bound to follow a set sort of factors in sentencing anybody whether it's for someone who was disorderly on the street or someone who took life. And those sentencing factors require, it's not a suggestion, it requires a judge to look at the gravity of the offense. So in the scheme of things, you would think loss of life is the most severe. But there are also some other depraved acts. We have a homicide sexual assault court, and they're not the same, the cases don't blend. Sometimes the act of the assault causes the homicide, but rarely. These four courts, for example, handle a combination of sexual assault cases, whether it's adult, adult, or adult on child cases in our system. And so you can expect that when crimes are so grave that the consequences and the sentencing factors related to that first point will be, you're probably going to score the highest you can as an offender in that category. Then you look at the character of the, uh, of the defendant, of the person who's been convicted. And then the final thing is, what's the impact on public safety? Uh, but you should also know that uh, in a twist that only, and I'm glad we're at the law school, and maybe there's some professors or judges or commissioners can back me up, that our law in America and in Wisconsin dictate that the first thing we do in any case is figure out what is the least amount of punishment that is necessary 
to thwart the behavior and get the citizen to act right. So we're not scientists. What we have to do is do better in collecting information. Sometimes people say when a person has been picked up with a hugely invasion of the public good with a huge crime, the first thing you might hear from some of the people uh, involved in the case is that this guy has been arrested 10 times. But guess what? You can arrest him 5,000 times. If he never comes to court, Maxine White will never get a chance to have him or her answer the crime. So there is a stream, and I'm not blaming, I'm not pointing any fingers anyway. And if I point a finger, it will be this way. But the, the fact of the matter is people get arrested, they get booked, they get charged. Sometimes the charges get amended or changed. Guess what? They are presumed innocent. The DA, the prosecutor, has a job of proving beyond a reasonable doubt that someone is guilty of an offense. And then after that proof is levied and a jury or a judge accepts it, you have the sentencing phase of a case. We have to gather all of the data. And the data that's uh, required, if you uh, have time and you want to read it, there's a case called State versus Gallion, G-A-L-L-I-O-N. It's probably a 47-page case by the Wisconsin Supreme Court that goes through all of the considerations and analysis in every case that a judge should speak out loud and have recorded about what she and he, she or he considered and why they came to a certain result. Uh, 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 uh. And in our training as judges, sometimes we're in a room like this. Throughout the state, there are 249 trial court judges. And once in a while in a training exercise, we have a scenario about someone who committed a crime. And we're from all of the 72 counties when we're in our training. Every year, uh, once a year, we get together in one place, all of the trial judges, the appellate judges, and the Supreme Court justices. In a training seminar, they will give us one of these little fancy button things where you push what your choices are if certain factors are in place. Because we are human, and we come to the bench with our own human elements. Who I am, I grew up in Mississippi on a farm, raised as a sharecropper's daughter, poorer than dirt, uh, saw injustices throughout my life, uh, worked really hard, and merit was not always the reward. So wh whomever the other people are in the state, they come to the bench with their life experiences, their training, their degrees, and they employ all of this in their reasoning process. So who you have on the bench, what the facts look like, how they sift through them for who the defendant is, how bad the crime is, the impact on the community, what did the victim say. You know, I've had hugely awful crimes by my standards where the family will come in and plead with the court not to do any harm, any further, anything else to their loved one who did such a bad thing to either them or somebody else. So what impact does all that information that we gather have on the sentencing judge? But in those exercises, when we touch that button out of the 249 of us, picking a year that we would give somebody for such a crime, you would be amazed at the span of differences. And I think that's the span of differences that exist in the human form. How do we interpret and translate and analyze? So how do we get closer to being more like each other if the like each other means better practices. Over the last few years nationally, in courts all over this land, including in Wisconsin, what we've done is pursued a practice called evidence-based decision making. And you would think, duh? You mean judges were making decisions without evidence before? No, the fact of the matter is it's a tool that's been blended by people, criminologists, soci sociologically minded people, and legal scholars to tell us if we give the judges certain tools that directs them to better decisions, maybe more of them, when they push that clicker, will be closer to the number of years that a person ought to get for a particular crime. So what they want us to do is be more reflective, to use these evidence-based practices to come to better results, not just for the public good and public safety, but also to predict 
Who should be in our prisons? My goodness, we are locking up America. I was fortunate enough to be sent by the Supreme Court to a 50-state forum in Austin, Texas, a couple of weeks ago. All 50 states sent four representatives to this forum. And guess what? Everybody is thirsty to try and figure out how to do it better and get it right, whatever that right may be in our communities. But everybody in the 50 states, whether they were southern, western, eastern, or midwestern, had the same questions. How can we do these jobs better? How can we anticipate in the young children who are in need of protection and suffering trauma, how can we do better by figuring out what to do for them when we learn that by age three, if certain things have occurred in their lives and the frontal lobe is not acting appropriately, that these people are gonna be devoid of any interest in bad consequences. That if we can identify them, then we can retrain them to mimic better behaviors, even if we can't give them the systemic replacement of what they lost in the traumatic lives that a lot of our children are deployed into in this nation. We're locking up a nation. So when people say, well, why didn't you give him 50 years or 20 years? And I say, do you know how much of your money we're spending now? And we lock people up and we have the same result. If we were doing it in a different type of CEO operation, you would fire me in a minute. If I kept locking up these people over and over for years and years and years, and they would return without having had inter any serious intervention. So we want to lock them up. They're going to get out eventually, because our laws say they will. But in the interim, we don't want to spend the money on resources for corrective behavior, because it's just too costly. Judge, let me jump in and follow up on that, um, because there, there's a lot of debate about what we should do um, in, in terms of our, our uh, decisions on whether to put people in jail, put people in prison. Um, and they almost, without exception, become um, political uh, battlefields where people strongly disagree on you know, the, that delicate balance of safety versus whether there are too many people in prison. Do we need a serious national conversation about this? Are we beginning to have a serious national conversation about this subject, whether or not there are too many people in jail? I know you might not want to accept the fact that we were in Texas and it was a serious national no. debate. No, I mean. And Texas is the leader. But Texas also just closed five prisons. Uh, and so there South is, Carolina's done that. And, I mean, and so there is there. a serious debate about are we missing the mark in not locking up the right people, the ones that really scare us? And are we, are we missing that mark because we have so much of a financial load in the criminal justice system? that we spread the resources so thin because we have so many people in that maybe need some other uh, initiative versus uh, the heavy hand of the number of years that they're serving, but they also need something else if they're doing this wraparound and coming back. Because remember, you're not going to give life sentences to the 120,000 people who came to our court last year, and you don't want to, because 35,000 of them were misdemeanors. So what's a misdemeanor? It is I shouted at you over your, your fence. It goes from that all the way up to anything that could get me less than a year in jail. So we have to decide on the lower end of the spectrum how to discern risk. One tool we're using in Milwaukee is that when people are arrested, we're screening them differently. Do they have mental health challenges? Are they a veteran and need other initiatives? Are they drug addicts uh, who are substance addicted and the crimes that they are perpetrating is more against their body and they're not selling drugs. So what we have are some initiatives, for example, like the drug treatment court. It is really a therapeutic court. It is not one, you, you make a deal with the district attorney. He knows what you are charged with, you know. He kind of puts that on hold and for 18 months, you have to cooperate with the protocol. It's a hard protocol and I'm not sure that some of us could, could meet it. It has a lot of things that those people have to do in order to work themselves out of that situation of that crime. We're screening now for mental health challenges. I'm told by our superintendent of the House of Corrections that in his shop of about 1,400 people, probably about a third of them have mental health diagnosis. That requires them when they're at the House of Corrections locked up to get their mental health 
medications, psychotropic drugs. I'm also being told that at the jail, when people are locked up, awaiting to be charged or whatever, when we do the screening there, that I'm told that about 15 to 20 percent of the 940 people jailed pretrial have mental health diagnosis. And these are not the ones that we were able to, through some type of systemic means, figure out if they had problems of trauma, mental health, or other things affecting them in their behavior. These were the ones who were already on their meds. So it was not like, well, maybe they're making it up. No, they're not make, we're going with the ones that are tried and true that's already being treated in that category. So what we've done with a few innovations in the drug treatment court is to make sure that when those people are placed there, that not everybody is treated with the same uh, therapy. If you have mental health problems and you have to come in because you're also uh, misusing illegal drugs or, or prescription drugs that are not your own, then you can have a clinical kind of um, setting in your criminal justice model with the drug treatment court. If you're a veteran who has traumatic experiences from having protected us uh, and our land, and you're, we have 40 people who are in a program, for example, who, in addition to whatever behavior they were experiencing, we know that the trauma they suffered uh, as men and women who face war for us that need extra special kind of care. We have other courts. We have domestic violence courts. We have three of them uh, with three judges doing nothing but domestic violence most of the time. So that families who hurt each other, the resolutions are brought before the court, and we try and come up with something else. Sometimes people want the violence to stop stop and make it stop and go away. And so do we lock them away from being parents to some of those courts have other ideas about who should be punished and what the punishment should be like. So I think in order to get out of this um, circumstance of having the public believe that we're soft on crime, you got to probably have some of those experiences that you had when you served on the jury and you can see the system close up. We're trying to be closer and uh, to the other stakeholders and giving them information when they have questions about an actor in the community tonight, where had they been in the criminal justice system before, what happened to them, and why. So we have commissions now. The mayor has a homicide co review commission, and every time someone dies at the hands of someone else, what they can do is, and they often do it all the time, call upon the court. And so through my administrators, what we do is staff the case. We take the person that's been charged. If they want us to look at the person that lost their life, we'll do that too, and see what were the contact points in our criminal justice system. And in that regard, a lot of the people have some of the same issues. That a long time ago, they were connected in some way as a child in need of protection. That they were also abused as children, that they suffered some type of trauma and that they have had contacts with the system brought on by themselves as a, a perpetrator and also by others with them as victims. Because sometimes we have this dual identity in our system that the citizens don't know about. Victim today, perpetrator tomorrow. Sometimes they cross. Uh, Judge White mentioned that, uh, yes, I did do jury duty uh, at the beginning of this year. Um, and it was a really interesting experience. I actually highly recommend it. Um, and, and, and was, I, I think, And so do I. I, I. It was actually very encouraging, um, I think. Um, but that experience was also an education because um, you see the courthouse and the safety building as they are. And, and, and this is a question that I want to ask you. And, and you talked about this earlier, that people feel that when they take part in the process, whether as a juror, whether as a witness, that they feel safe in that environment. Um, how big a concern is that for you? We just saw a Journal Sentinel story in the past uh, week or so about uh, witness intimidation. That's Yes, it's a DA matter, but, but it goes to this bigger issue of safety. How much attention are you paying to that as an issue? Well, we, we do everything we can and is subject specific. And what I mean by that is, if you're on the jury over there where there's a medical malpractice case going on now, you probably don't have the same mindset about walking down to the cafeteria and whatever's going on with you. You take your buddies that you've made on the new jury experience and you go over to the museum and you come back, you follow the rules that the judge gives you, don't talk about the case, 
you know, don't let anybody else talk, don't read anything on these subjects, and you get all of your instructions over and over again. The lawyers have overpriced suits on, and the judge is probably the, the worst dressed person in the, in the courtroom. They got high technology and screens up. That's just one trial going on right now. They got all kinds of exhibits about whatever the medical issue was. If you're on the fourth floor with small claims, sitting in a courtroom, you got a couple of bailiffs up front, a lot of people, and all he has to make sure is, don't chew your gum so loud. If you're going to knit, you know, make sure you do it quietly. Uh, tell, turn your cell phones off. And that, that one person can handle this whole crowd if you were here in small claims, waiting to sue your neighbor for up to 10000 for something or something. But if you're in a jury pool and you have been instructed by the court that you will be called upon to decide whether or not this person willfully and intentionally and blah, 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 uh, caused the loss of life to person A, you're a different kind of mindset than the jury that's just enjoying the experience. So what the court has done before you arrive and will do every time you're there is do everything we can. Use the resources we have. And that's human bailiffs. Those are sheriff deputies. Use the law clerks and instructions. Try and move you in a way from destination A to destination B that minimizes your contact with other people. Try and set your hours in a way that's respectful, that you come in when it's light, you leave when it's light, that your lunch hour is defined in a way or that we provide you with bad chicken or bad pizza. But, but we don't have the Oprah court. So I always felt like apologizing to the jury, especially if I had you there for one, three days, about going upstairs to the jury room in, in the courthouse. It's grungy. Uh, it's, the air vents are uh, right outside your window and it's as wide as, as my body, and they're making noise. The furniture is... You're not gonna, it's not a Marquette. I mean, you're not gonna, you know, you might not even wanna put your sandwich plate down on the table in there. But my staff and I, just like the other 46 judges, do whatever they can to make you comfortable. We buy water and big store bought water bottles for you out of our own personal funds. We bring in comfort things for you out of our own funds. We do what we can to make you comfortable while drilling into your intellect over and over again that you will decide the facts of this case. I can't do that. You have to do that. I'm sure your judge told you. You are in charge of deciding the facts of the case, applying the law that I give you and nothing else to the facts, and your result will control. And it's rare that your results as a juror, as a group, will not control. Really rare, unless there's some misconduct. Your decision about whether someone acted in a certain way, whether it's civil or criminal or otherwise, your decision is absolutely important. It's the worst job that I've had in my life and the most challenging job every time I called the jury in 23 years. I felt an overwhelming burden in the realm of, will this be a just result? Will this person accused of a crime that if he or she is convicted, I won't see them until after I finish all my retirement. I know that this crime was so bad, and the history of this person is so bad, and the facts and the impact on the community and this victim is so bad, this person is not going to be released if they're found guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. And juries that sit and make those decisions in our state deserve the best that we can give them. And the best that I can give you now is not the best that you deserve. But the judges in this room know right now, and the commissioners, that the county exec has employed a fiscal uh, analysis unit of folks to look at our space so that every time it rains, we're not shuffling juries and, and judges and court reporters out of a courtroom that looks like something out of the movies, but it's just not functional because it hasn't been maintained. So we're doing what we can to maintain the facility for comfort. But in the midst of all of this, while you're walking down the hall and you see people chained together, because that's the way they bring them to court, uh, we have to keep fighting against the impressions, the implicitness, things we're planting in your head when you see people being moved in a certain way in the courthouse, and me wondering what effect would that have on you as an actor in this system, as a juror. You know, we don't have that many elevators. 
to move that many people for 21 courts. And the one thing that people fuss about is the amount of time it takes to try a case. First thing I say to them is, in good humor and bad humor, I am not Oprah. There will not be a commercial break, and if it is, you're not going to be done. And I will be reading things to you that just drone and on and on about what the law is, what the factors are, like baking a cake, the ingredients. I can bake just a butter cake, but give me one that got all that other stuff in it and the toppings and you got to make the sauce on the side. That's the kind of thing that happens in a lot of courts. It's a lot of information. You're not lawyers sometimes. You're not doctors measuring the medical information. But regardless of the subject matter, and this is the power of our justice system, the power and the uniqueness of it compared to other places in the world, that ordinary citizens, ones who are formally trained and not formally trained, regardless of where they come from in the world or what they look like, have an opportunity to serve. And you will be given the power as one twelfth of a team to decide the fate either of a corporate entity or of an individual. And we give you that power as citizens. But we keep the law. We keep the standards, and you're supposed to accept ours. And the law is developed by the legislative branch, interpreted and regurgitated by the, by the justice system through the trial courts. But it is absolutely important that people understand that when they come down to the courthouse, and I think you commented on this, that even though you knew you had two people that were being tried and there were eight different jury verdict questions that had to be answered, it still was a lengthy process based on your learned expectation. You've talked to a lot of people, including judges. And if you feel that way, that feedback we get tempers us on other cases to make sure that we're using the time wisely and that not, we're not missing anything that's critical to a just outcome. Because remember, I started this conversation with saying that my vision and my goal was to follow the mission, that is to provide a fair forum, one that's independent, separated from the politics. To have this job and to do it right by maxing white standards, you can't be scared. You can't worry about politics. Once you start worrying about the body politic and whether the decision that I make is right, and I know it's right, but I'm not going to do it because I'm afraid of whatever the public might think, then you're not fit to be a judge on the bench with me. Because it's a tough job. It's a job that takes away babies, property, liberty. And it's a strong uh, uh, assessment of our justice system that you give the power in one judge over and over at a time to make huge decisions. And they need to be brave, tough, learned people who are willing to do what's right, that's consistent with the rule of law, but also represent discretion and a fair interpretation of those rules as they apply to each entity, be it a thing as a corporation or a person or place. That's our job. And it's a hard job. And I hope that in the midst of all of this fear in the air, that our judiciary keeps being the flagship for other nations. They come to see us. They come to see us, judges from all over the world. Every year, we have about four or five different groups. We need translators to talk to them, because they don't speak our language, and we don't speak theirs. But they're so interested. Some of them are just now starting a system that allows a citizen to be presumed innocent. Because they, they didn't presume anybody innocent. They're trying to get what we do, and how does that work? They want us to explain it. We presume people innocent. And it's not just wink, wink, a joke. It shouldn't be. And if it is, it's wrong. And it's against the law. So what I think that, that uh, I enjoy about the outreach that we can do in the role as judges, and I think judges are here at the other law school and public centers all over this county and state, is that we can talk to you about what the system is. You can come and ride along with some of the judges. I mean, sit at the bench with them. If you're not related to anybody or invested in any way, you can come and take a look. So you can be our ambassadors of, no, that's not the way it works, when you see something printed and it doesn't make sense. And when we get it wrong, we're the first ones running to close those gaps. And we do get it wrong sometimes, because we are not widgets. 
We are not what some people want. They want to feed data into a machine, and then we're to pull the lever. Then you don't need us. You don't need us. So I am so glad that there's such a variety of people here from the county today who can, can continue your learning aspect about this part of your system and become ambassadors for it. You can critique it. You can criticize us. You can give us feedback. And we're flexible because we want to do better at what we do for the people every day. Let me uh, take about 10 minutes worth of questions. If you have a question and you're seated uh, in the seating bowl, please press down on the rim, not on the little ball, but on the rim. Keep your finger down on that. Uh, if you're seated in the back and you have a question, please wait for Ryan, a gentleman over there on the left. He has a microphone, and then we'll all be able to hear your question. So anybody have a question, please feel to raise your hand. I'll start back there, right there. Judge, thank you for coming here, and thank you for your good work. Obviously, it looks like our system is a bit overwhelmed by the crime and the uh, other problems that come with that that you've talked about, and it looks like you're addressing that. For many people, the experience with the court, though, is not in the criminal sense, but rather it's in the sense of trying to resolve some very serious civil disputes, whether, they're, whether they involve families, whether they involve real estate, whether they involve serious personal injuries and others. And the complaint you hear so much from, uh, from lay people as well as lawyers is that it just takes forever. You can't, you can't move your case through because the criminal cases take up all the space, all the time, and all the resources. What's your plan with respect to being able to expedite the resolution of civil disputes in the court system? Well, I, I think that my predecessors, and I am too, we are holding the fort. Uh, when I took the bench, I heard people announcing that I was opening another gun court. I thought, wow, nobody talked to me. Uh, but and, but I, did, I did speak to them, the ones who were interested in declaring, because I think they had genuine interest and thought that was a solution. And uh, you're right. Uh, there are a whole lot of other people, and most of the people in this room, and it's just a bad guess of mine, that if you come to court, you're supporting somebody else in an action, for divorce, paternity, something's going on, in, or you have a civil action, a foreclosure, some type of money issue, an employment issue, a medical issue you want to have the court step in and resolve, or you, want, you have an administrative action against some government body, and we are the appellate courts for them. And so you're right, but what I did, and just, this is just one example, to represent how I understand exactly what you're talking about. First of all, I sat in the civil court for eight years, and it is, it is an overwhelmingly challenging but fulfilling opportunity. And I was there when we had the uh, huge number of foreclosures. So we came up with processes the 14 judges did in that division to try and shorten the time and figure out a way to deal with, with the uh, cases. Some cases are uh, duty bound to take time because statutorily the discovery period and everything else stretches everything out. But in terms of having the resources, the judges and commissioners assigned to those courts, I'm holding firm. 21 out of 47 is enough criminal courts. So when I heard the cry from the mayor, the DA, the public defender, the attorney general, and everybody else that we got to do something to make sure that the courts are ready to hear the non-fatal shootings, the gun cases, and the uh, homicides, what I said was, we already have four judges doing nothing but homicides and sexual assaults. And their caseload is some of the lowest caseload in the state. So they're ready. They're in the saddle and waiting on those. I said, when it comes to the gun court, if I made another gun court for the non-fatal shooting, you would have just one more judge hearing one more case a week. And so instead of making, taking away a civil judge, and making him a criminal gun court judge, what I did was I left the non-fatal shootings with the one gun court, and I talked to five of my colleagues. You know, when you got minions and you got buddies that are minions, you're in a good place. So we have a cooperative, collaborative bench. It's the best thing that can happen to me is to lead the 46 people that I work with and the 22 commissions. Because I went to five of them who handled general crimes and I said, I looked at your numbers. Can you help out the gun court? If I took out the non, if I left him with just the non-fatal shootings, and I give the rest of you just the firearms cases, the ones who possess them 
in violation of the law, and spread them over each of you, give you 50 more cases each, could you handle it? I said, do you want me to spread out the pain or take away from civil? They said, we'll take 50 more and help out the gun court. Don't cut civil. So we're standing firm. You're not going to lose any judges, not going to lose any commissioners over there. And we're doing what we can, because when judges go to that division, it's a learning curve. If you've been in the criminal courts, you were a federal or a state prosecutor for eight or nine years before you became a judge. You come to the court. You go to juvenile court, and then you go to crime. You, you have a learning curve for the large claim civil cases. So what we're doing is bearing down and drilling in on training needs and giving supportive services to that division. And Tim Dugan is the presiding judge over that division now, and I have other presiding judges in other divisions. I have my deputy chief judge, Joe Donald, here uh, in the back of the room who helps me with leadership matters, and Mary Trujano is also one of my deputies. Uh, and so I hear what you're saying, and I like what you're saying, because sometimes people get so hung up on the crime, they want me to assign 50 judges to 120 cases if they're crime. But you're here as a voice. You're the voice of the vast number of cases we have, which are civil disputes, where you want and deserve a forum to have that settled as quickly as possible. Am I right? So I'm doing the best I can to push back on people who want me to cut your interest division and give more to crime. I say we need to do crime differently and smarter, rather than spread out the resources in that one area, doing the same thing the same way over and over, and getting the same results. Let me take one more question here. Yeah, go ahead. Hang, hang on one second. Wait for the microphone, please. Although his voice is as big as mine. <laughs> I'll try to settle down a little bit. What can the Milwaukee County judges do to reduce violent crime in the Milwaukee area? Well, I think if we had that secret, I wouldn't wear the robe for the price you pay me. <laughs> I, and I'm not just being catty. The first thing I tell everybody is that I have to stay in our lane. A lot of people want to push your judges into other lanes. We can share information. We can teach. We can show you. We can tell you what we know once the dispute gets to us, regardless of what it is. We can tell you what the clientele looks like that appears before our court, what their pedigree is, how much education they have, how old, what race, what gender. We give you all the information and the data. But as long as we're your judges making decisions about the outcome of disputes, we have to be careful about crossing the line and waving and, and marching with you about everything. We can't, we're not police officers. We're not cops. We're not district attorneys. We're not public defenders or trial lawyers. We are not, you know, the social service agency. And when people say, I'm going to bring my kid down to juvie court and let you all handle it, I say, don't do that. <laughs> That's not a good idea. That's not what we do. We are duty bound. I'll start, I'll end where I started. We, don't, we can't act until it comes to us. And if it gets to us the wrong way, we throw it out. We don't develop the rules. The legislative body tells us what the rules are. The Supreme Court help us differentiate whether or not they got it right or whether or not we have to abide by it. Once we figure out what the rules are and come to a conclusion, we do. I'll tell you what we are doing now. We are marrying our lane with other lanes where it's appropriate. Because in some states like ours, they move the line a little bit to allow the judges to insert themselves more. So what we're doing is, for example, right now at the courthouse, some of my colleagues and other people from other divisions of government are meeting with a group called the MacArthur Foundation. We're trying to get $2 million. It's not to dress up the jury room or to get my uh, chambers looking better, but that $2 million if we get it, we're trying to use it in the community in some way to thwart, to kind of deflect, handle the behavioral problems pre-courthouse. So even though we're doing the, the, uh, the huge heavy load lifting on trying to bring in the resources, this is just one example because we do it a lot. We get just enough money to run the courts, bring in the staff and hear your cases, and everything else 
All the gravy, we make it. We make it from flour and lard, no meat. And so what we do is we're trying to bring in resources to say, if 100 people cost us almost $5 million last year, and they're mentally ill, and they keep beating up their family's property, beating up each other, the police don't know what to do with them, uh, they're afraid to, that they're going to get in trouble if they handle them, they take them to the mental ward, the mental ward turns away to take them to the court, come into court, and we don't know what to do with them. We're trying to get money to deflect and help the mental health community come up with crisis teams where if the police officers, for example, just an example of one of the suggestions, if they can determine that this is a mental health crisis and really not a criminal, that we have money to build places that have safe, safety built in with clinicians and security so that people can be stabilized on their medication rather than brought to the courthouse. Because what we're having is we're spending a lot of money on those and the police officers are tied up with those. And if the courts get tied up with that, then we're not really focusing on where are the danger points in our community. They, they're outnumbered. Everybody is outnumbered because we're spreading so thin. So we're trying to be a player, the court, with everybody else where it's appropriate. And there are lines. I keep telling people, there are certain things that I can tell you, uh-uh, no, when you call me. Don't waste your time coming to the courthouse if you want me to, for example, open a court in your community center or your church. You can't afford a court outside of the courthouse. Too many pieces, too much money. Too many uh, county versus state versus all kind of other, other uh, attachments go in there. But we're doing what we can. But the judges are not uh, responsible in the way that people think we are. Yelling at folks don't stop, don't thwart the bad behavior. They're not afraid of us. And they're definitely not afraid of me when I'm at Century or someplace and not wearing a robe. Uh, and so we have to figure out a way where you take what we know, take it to your community uh, block club, and say it's not a good idea, because I heard from my judge uh, in this county that it's not a good idea to do certain things in a certain way, because there's danger attached to that. that. That if you have concerns about X, Y, Z, you, you should go to these factors. You should go to the police, rely on your community group, talk to the DA, support somebody who's a victim. Do you know how difficult it is, and you may know from your experiences, to be a victim? I get a lot of complaints about even people who are uh, uh, well-trained and resourced to the max have called me after they left that courthouse and said, you have got to be kidding. They can have the car. It's too hard. I, I don't have the support I need. You know, I didn't have the right. I didn't have the understanding of the system. So what we're trying to do is close those gaps. Can we get money from a grant to get a coordinator, a clinician to help the DA? And the DA gets help from the AG. The AG is giving the DA two prosecutors help with the gun cases. So we're doing what we can within our lanes. But we are not community activists. We are not politicians. And I don't know why this state created a judgeship like we have. Well, we get elected. I can't ask you for a dime. I can't do anything political. And, and all I can do is explain to you who I am, what my vision is, and how I would react if you gave me an opportunity to serve. But because we are on the ballot, I think that people expect that there's another connection between the body politic and the judiciary. But if I act in a certain way with you, I am removing myself from the opportunity to be your judge. Because if I've engaged with you in certain ways against the Supreme Court rules, I can't sit in judgment on your business, on your child, on your case. So we'll do what we can, but in order for you to have this very important uh, branch of government, operating there for you with that forum that's fair, independent, effective, and also uh, accessible. Uh, I have to stay in our lane when it's not appropriate to, to drive to the side of the road. I'm going to have to uh, wrap things up. Uh, before we go, I wanted to mention just a couple of things. Tomorrow, we'll release the uh, latest Marquette University Law School poll. Uh, 
Uh, Professor Charles Franklin, the director of the poll, will be with us to uh, break down the results and provide some analysis of what we've learned. And, uh, and I always encourage uh, any of you who uh, attend these events to go to our website on a regular basis, law.marquette.edu, and check out uh, the On the Issues uh, icon. We'll uh, be listing some new events here in the next uh, couple of weeks. Uh, again, thank you for your time, your interest, your attention, and most of all, thanks to Chief Judge Maxine White. Good to have you here. Thank you. And thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.